this is, young people. Last week we looked at Joseph the man and some of the exhortations that Joseph has for us from his life. This week we're going to look at Joseph as a type. Before we do, I want us to just think for a minute or two about what the scripture says about types. And we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus is in discussion with the scribes and the Pharisees. So Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah's experience in the belly of the whale was a figure, was a prophecy, was a foreshadowing, was a type of Jesus in the tomb. And we can look through the Old Testament and we can find many, many more examples like that. Uh, and I believe that Joseph is the supreme one of all, of all of them. But we need to bear in mind that not all the details correspond. So just ask yourself the question, why was Jonah in the belly of the whale? And the answer is that he'd fled west to Tarshish instead of going east to Assyria to preach the gospel that God had given to him. In other words, Jonah was disobedient to God. Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights because he was obedient. He had done all that God commanded him, including offering his life as a sacrifice for sin. So, so not all the details fit, but some certainly do. So we can study types. We can find some character or some incident in the Old Testament and look at it and see Christ. And we can start writing down the parallels. Well, so far I've got over 200 of Joseph. Um, I've brought some copies with me. There's a few copies on the platform for those who don't have internet access. Brother Stuart will have the electronic version, so if you have got internet, then talk to Brother Stuart and get a copy. I've also found 60 in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den, and nearly 30 in 1 Samuel 15, 16, 17, where David flees from Jerusalem, paralleling Jesus leaving the upper room with his disciples. So we can compile quite a lot of lists of parallels from the Old Testament to the life of Christ. But what's the profit of that? You know, what, what good does that do us spiritually? Well, first of all, hopefully, it increases our, in, our appreciation of the inspiration of Scripture. You know, that it was one mind which caused these things to be written concerning Joseph and recorded things concerning Christ, as we shall see later, with precisely the same words. And that's good, because... The inspiration of scripture, which is our foundation principle in our statement of faith, is under attack at the moment. We're being told the Bible's full of mistakes and errors. Can't be the word of God at all. So it's good from that point of view. We might also ponder how Jesus would have felt when he read these chapters in what we call the book of Genesis and read through the life of Joseph and saw himself there and knew that God had delivered Joseph from all his afflictions, made him ruler over all Egypt, and all his brethren bowed down to him. I think that would be a great strength and comfort to the Lord Jesus Christ in the days of his flesh. But his father had cared for Joseph, and his father would care for him. It's probably good for us as well to see how God has cared for these faithful men and women in time past. But there are other aspects of types. Turn with me now to Acts chapter 7, to Stephen's speech. See, Jesus said that Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites. It's the Greek word semion. But in Acts chapter 7, we have the Greek word tupos, which is translated types later on, as we shall see. So Acts 7, verse 44 Stephen says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion, the type, that he had seen. 
Now turn on to Hebrews chapter 8, where we have the same word in a similar context. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. The Apostles writing about the, the things under the law of the priests. Hebrews 8 verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern, the type, showed to thee in the mount. So the tabernacle was a, a prophecy. It was a foreshadowing. It was a type of something which Moses had in effect seen in the heavens. And the Apostle will expand more of that in chapter 9. Now turn back a few pages to 1 Corinthians 10. And the subject becomes a lot more relevant, a lot more focused. Hebrews chapter 10, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And I guess that if we were writing an account of Israel leaving Egypt and going through the Red Sea, we probably wouldn't have used the word baptism in that context. Verse 3. They did all eat the same spiritual meat and they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, says the Apostle. Now, he says in verse 6, these things were our examples, our types, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And he goes on in the next verses to list four of the evil things that they did lust after. And then he writes in verse 11, now all these things happened unto them, them for in samples, margin, types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. So Israel in the wilderness are types of us. So we generally think of types as being types of Jesus. But here we have the people in the wilderness are types of us. They are a prophecy, they are a foreshadowing of our journey through the wilderness of life. Now turn over to chapter 11 and verse 1. The Apostle says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Some of the more modern versions translate that as imitators. The Greek word is actually the word from which we get our word mimic. And that's what the Apostle Paul was seeking to do. He was seeking to mimic, to imitate in his life, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to 1 Timothy 4. And let's take it a stage further. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example, a type of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. In all these things you show to the believers in your life what the life is really all about. How Christ lived. How God wants us all to live. And <coughs> Titus also. Titus chapter 2 and verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern, a type. Same word as was used of the tabernacle. Being a pattern of the things in the heavens. So Titus was to be a pattern of heavenly things, of the spiritual life. Being a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So both of these young men, Timothy and Titus, were to be types in the Ecclesia. They were to show to the Ecclesia what the Christ life was really like. So we need to ask the question, well, is that what we're doing? See, Jesus said to Philip, he who hath seen me hath seen the Father. Because the words that he spoke were the Father's words. The things that he did were what the, the Father willed to be, do, to be done. 
And when we look at the life of Joseph, as we're going to now, we can see Christ in him. He who has seen Joseph, in a sense, has seen Christ. But can we see ourselves in Joseph? We should be able to, if we are imitators of Christ. So yes, Joseph is magnificently a type of Christ. But is he a type of us? Should be. And if he isn't, fault's not with him. It's with us. So that's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to look at Joseph, we're going to see Christ, and hopefully we're going to see ourselves. Bring out some of the amazing ways in which Joseph was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, and hopefully is a type of us. So, let's begin in Genesis 37, where the account of Joseph starts. And um, If we just, sort of an overall look at Joseph... Um, both Joseph and Jesus were firstborn sons of their mothers. Both of them spent time in Egypt. Both of them were hated by their brethren. Genesis 37 verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And in Matthew 3 verse 17 God says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <coughs> Do we think that in our lives we are giving God cause to love us? We are his adopted sons, not his begotten son. But are we giving him cause in the things that we do and say and think to love us? Genesis 37 verse 8 And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. In John chapter 10 we read that the Jews took up stones to stone Jesus. And Jesus said, I've done many good works. For which of those works do you stone me? And they said, for a good work we stone thee not. But for blasphemy, for your words. Because thou being a man makest thyself God. So they hated Jesus. For his words. Do men hate us. Because we speak the truth. Jesus said. Marvel not if the world hates you. We should expect it to. If we uphold the standards of the truth. In our lives and in our speech. But you see. There's, there's a movement afoot at the moment. To dilute our beliefs. With the thinking of the world. So that by not taking the first 11 chapters of the Bible literally, we can sort of go along with world opinion while, while maintaining or hoping to our moral standards. So we can be liked by people in the world and not have to stand against them. Because that's uncomfortable to the flesh. Now in these dreams of Joseph, particularly in the second one, <coughs> Well, the, well, taking these dreams together. In the first one, things which were of the earth, earthy, bowed down to him, the sheaves of corn. In the second one, it's heavenly things, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars, made obeisance to me. And in Philippians chapter 2, the apostle says that all things in heaven and in earth will bow to Christ. Genesis 37, verse 13. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem. Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he's going to make a journey through bear country, through lion country, through bandit country, through the Canaanites, to brothers whom he knew hated him. And he said, Here am I. And he goes. The Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> knew from very early age what lay before him. But quoting Psalm 40, he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O my God. Is that our attitude? Even though what lies before us may be hard, may be difficult, may be uncomfortable for our flesh, do we seek to do the will of our Father, as Joseph did? 
And when he got there, chapter 37, verse 16, he said to the man, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And he wasn't just seeking them geographically. He was seeking them spiritually. Just as the Son of Man in Luke 19 and verse 10 came to seek and to save that which is lost. So turn the focus on ourselves. How much seeking, including praying for, lost brothers and sisters are we doing? How much more could we do if we really put our minds to it? This seeking of his brethren occupied a tremendous amount of Joseph's thinking and his life until he had achieved it, as we shall see as we go through. Their reaction, of course, in verse 18 of chapter 39 was, of chapter 37 was, that when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And if we look at Matthew 27 verse 1, when Jesus and Judas went to the chief priests and the collusion which clearly took place between those chief priests and Pilate and add in Acts chapter 4 where the disciples say against thy holy child Jesus both the Jews and the Gentiles and Herod and Pontius Pilate were gathered together it was all a great conspiracy to get rid of this man and Joseph's brothers prefigure and prophesy all of that. But of course Joseph was not killed by his brethren. Jesus was. But he was taken into Egypt. And if we just move back in time, there was an occasion when Jesus was not killed by Herod, but was taken into Egypt. And as we saw last week, when he was in Egypt, Genesis 39 verse 2, Yahweh was with Joseph. <coughs> He was a prosperous man and he was in the house of the Egyptian. And in John chapter 16 and verse 32, Jesus said, The Father is with me. And he was. So verse 3 of Genesis 39, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Turn to Isaiah 53 and see how that language is picked up. In that wonderful chapter that the Jews don't read in their synagogue because it points so clearly to Jesus of Nazareth, the one whom they still reject as their Messiah. So Isaiah 53 and verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's the very phrase from Genesis chapter 39 verse 3, where Yahweh made all that Joseph did to prosper in his hand. And in verse 6 of Genesis 39, Joseph kept all that was committed unto him. His master knew not all that he had, save the bread that he did eat. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 says that the Lord is able to keep all that we have committed to him. So how are we doing, brothers and sisters, at keeping the things that he has committed to us? Moving down now to Genesis 39 and verse 10. Potiphar's wife has said to him, come and lie with me. Verse 10 of Genesis 39, It came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, but he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Day by day she spake to him. Jesus was tempted every day. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And we, brothers and sisters, likewise are tempted every day. Do we take the sort of measures that, that Joseph took? You know, he was very careful that he wouldn't listen to her, he wouldn't be with her. And the implication of verse 11 is he, he tried to make sure that there were other men around him when she was around, so that she couldn't work out her designs upon him. You know, he did practical things to 
make sure that he didn't fall to this temptation. And that's a lesson for all of us. So both Joseph and Jesus were falsely accused. Both were silent against that accusation. And in both cases, two malefactors were involved. Genesis 40 and verse 1, It came to pass after these things that the butler and the, of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And the two of them were put in the prison where Joseph was. When the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, there were two malefactors crucified, one either side of him. And there's bread and wine involved, isn't there? Because you've got a butler and a baker. And one of them died, and the other one lived, just as it was with Jesus. The one on the one side continued to rail on him until he expired. The other one, Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, because he believed. And they were put in the charge of Joseph. And in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 40, Joseph came unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad today, so sadly today? Joseph was concerned about them. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. And we'll see the parallelism in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Luke chapter 24, we read of two of Jesus' disciples who went on a journey to a village called Emmaus, which is about 60 furlongs from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass, verse 15 of Luke 24, that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? So he found two downcast people, just as Joseph did. And both Jesus and Joseph were active in, in teaching these people the things of God. So how are we doing? Looking around us for those who are sad and downcast that we might lift them up and encourage them in the truth. Just look at the reaction of these two on the road to Emmaus. Verse 32 of Luke 24. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? While he opened to us the scriptures? Could we have that effect upon a brother or sister who's feeling down because of the circumstances of their life? We saw last week when we looked at the way that Joseph was always talking about his God. In Genesis 40 and verse 8, they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray thee. And the Lord Jesus Christ in, in John 5 said, I can of mine own self do nothing. The Father has given to me that I speak. And he will show me greater works than these that ye may marvel. So as Jesus went through his ministry, the Father revealed to him the things that he should do and gave him the power to do them. And we need to recognise that we are nothing. It's God's word that has the power to change lives. And it's God's work that we should be doing. Let's go again to Psalm 105. We looked at this wonderful psalm last week. We noted that Psalms 104, 105, 106 are a commentary on the whole of the Old Testament. An inspired commentary. Revealing things which we don't read in the historical record. So in Psalm 105 and verse 20, having seen last week that Joseph's feet were hurt with fetters and he was laid in iron and how the word of the Lord tried him. Then we read in verse 20 of Psalm 105, the king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. 
In Acts 2 verse 24, Peter says that God loosed the pains of death, that Jesus should not be holden of them. And when Joseph gets into the presence of Pharaoh in Genesis 41 and verse 38, Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such an one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Peter in the as of Cornelius explains how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and how he went around about doing miracles. And Pharaoh's testimony concerning Joseph, we read in Genesis 41 verse 39, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. And the Lord Jesus Christ exhorts us to be faithful and wise servants. Joseph was, was faithful in all things. And his wisdom is manifest in this chapter as he plans out the work of the first seven years to gather in all the food that's going to feed the world for the next seven years. He was a faithful and a wise servant. As, of course, supremely was the Lord Jesus Christ. So are we serving faithfully and wisely? If we want to know how to do it, look at the context of Jesus' statement in Matthew 25, where he tells a parable about faithful and unfaithful virgins, and then another parable about wise and foolish servants. There's much for us to learn in those things. In Genesis 41 and verse 40 Pharaoh says only in the throne will I be greater than thou and 1 Corinthians 15 28 tells us of the time when Jesus will hand back the kingdom to God that God may be all and in all that the son may be subject unto the father in all things just as Joseph was to Pharaoh so in Genesis 42, we have the record of the brothers coming down to Joseph. And he spoke roughly to them. He took them for spies. He interrogated them. He put them in prison. You notice in Genesis 42 and verse 17, it says, He put them all together into ward three days. The margin says Hebrew gathered. Don't fully understand this. If anybody can help afterwards, please do. But I believe there's something here that relates to the first dream. You know, the gathering of the stalks of corn and the, <coughs> the making of sheaves. It's related to, and of course, the whole of this circumstance about corn in Egypt is related to that first dream of, of harvesting corn. So he put them in the ward three days and he lets them out. And he said, right, which of you is going to go back to your father and fetch your younger brother? And none of them come forward because they all know that Jacob won't trust Benjamin with any of them. And they say in verse 21, we are verily guilty concerning our brother. And that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this anguish come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake not I unto thee, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore also, behold, his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them. And that's at two levels. He hadn't forgotten his Hebrew, so he could follow that conversation. But he also understood the state of their mind. If we go to Isaiah chapter 11, we'll find that that's exactly what is foretold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. We've already read that Pharaoh said, we can't find a better man than this because the Spirit of God is in him. So Isaiah 11 verse 2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding. 
in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. That's exactly what Joseph did with his brothers. And through that process, he brought them to salvation. Jesus, of course, knew what was in men, as the Gospel said. He didn't need anyone to testify of men. We don't have that insight by the power of the Spirit that he had. But what we do have are these scriptures in which we find, time and again, God's verdicts upon what is right and what is wrong. So we should have a level of understanding which is greater than the people around us in the world. And we should be applying that in our dealings with others. Because we know what's right. We know what's pleasing to God. And we know what he hates. And our attitudes should be the same. Let's move on now to Genesis 44. Where they've come down the second time with Benjamin. And Joseph's cup's been hidden in Benjamin's sack. And Joseph's servant comes out to pursue them and interrogate them and say, where is it? And their response in Genesis 44 verse 9. With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die and we also will be the Lord's bondmen. And the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6. To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. His servants ye are. And the New Testament makes it quite clear that we are bondmen. But we are not to be the servants of sin. We have to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, which is a reasonable, our reasonable service. And be, as the Apostle Paul was, bond slaves to Christ. And so at the beginning of chapter 45, Joseph reveals himself to his brethren. And of course, in terms of Jesus and his brethren, that's still to come. We moved into the future in terms of the, the antitype. They have yet to look upon him whom they pierced and mourned for him. But this, the early verses of this chapter foreshadow that in the life of Joseph and his brothers. And they're terrified. But Joseph comforts them and he tells them that there's more famine to come yet. And he says in verse 11, you go into the land of Goshen, Genesis 45 verse 11, and there will I nourish thee, for there are yet five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, he that cometh to me will never hunger. So when brothers and sisters, young people come to us, do we feed them with the milk of the world or the strong meat according as they're able to bear it? That's our responsibility to one another, to nourish. So in chapter 47, Joseph sends five of his brethren, what is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And of course the Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. And Peter in his first epistle, chapter 5, says to the elders, feed the flock of God. So we each have a responsibility of shepherding within the ecclesia, within the household of faith. Are we performing it? Even the young ones. I heard of an ecclesia which was uh, trying to sort out which of the younger brethren um, ought to be asked to exhort on a Sunday. And it was pointed out to the arranging brethren that there was one young brother who every time he came into the ecclesia and his Bible was open. He had a group of young people around him and he was instructing them. He's the sort of brother, he said, that you want on the platform. We can all undertake this role in some degree. So the famine got harsher and harsher. 
And in Genesis 47 and verse 18, when that year was ended, the Egyptians came to Joseph the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord hath also our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. And that's where we are, brothers and sisters. <coughs> we have to present our bodies as living sacrifices unto God. Because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Because the context of that passage in Hebrews 10 is, I come, of, I come to do thy will, O God, is a body hast thou prepared me. And he offered that body, as we've read in Isaiah 53, as a sacrifice for sin. And Hebrews 10 continues that we are sanctified, we are made holy by the offering of the body of Jesus once. We have nothing in this world but the things that God has given us. And what he seeks is that we give ourselves to him, as Joseph did, and as Jesus did. Let's go now finally to Genesis chapter 49. To Jacob's blessing upon Joseph. Some of the brothers got very, very short words from Jacob. But not Joseph. Genesis 49 verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough. Even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. Jesus said, I am the true vine. You see, it's all about bearing fruit. The very first thing that God said to Adam and Eve was, be fruitful. And he did not mean have lots of children. Because he said, be fruitful and multiply. And you get to Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. And men began to multiply upon the face of the earth. And God determined to destroy the lot. Because there was no fruit. They'd heeded the second commandment. They'd multiplied, but there was no fruit. So right through scripture. From Genesis 1, 28. Through John 15. Herein is my father glorified that she bring forth much fruit and on into the book of Revelation God has declared that this is what he wants from us so are we producing fruit is the Lord going to say of us at the judgment he she is a fruitful bough Genesis 49 verse 24 but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Joseph was the shepherd. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. And we'll see what it says about Jesus as a shepherd. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, <coughs> through the blood of the everlasting covenant. This is a tremendous verse. Just on a doctrinal point, those words there, through the blood, occur in eight other New Testament passages. Greek words for through and blood. And if you look at those eight passages, it is very clear that the meaning of it is, is that by means of that blood, so and so and so and so happened. Absolutely clear. So translate it back into Hebrews 13 verse 20. It was because he offered that sacrifice, because he died that death, that God raised him from the dead. If he died any other death, it would not have met the Father's requirements. He had to die that death. He had to shed his blood as a sacrifice for sin and to bring in the new covenant. But because he did that, this great shepherd of the sheep, as he is called, is brought forth that he might do that work of shepherding during his millennial reign. Because that's what Psalm 2 says that he will do. 
from we've already considered, 1 Peter 5 verse 2. The elders which are among you, I exhort, feed the flock of God. And that's a very serious responsibility, particularly upon the elders in the Ecclesia, to encourage and help and sustain our young people and our young brothers and sisters and our children against the dangers and pressures of this world. You may have noticed in Genesis 49 and verse 24 that Joseph is also called the stone of Israel, as was the Lord Jesus Christ. We come down now to Genesis 49 and verse 26. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was a Nazarite from his brethren. That's the first occurrence in the, the Hebrew Bible of the word Nazarite. Translated here separate because that's what it means. Joseph was separate from his brethren. Now there are three Greek words that are translated in the New Testament as separate, separating, separated, etc. So only one of them is ever used of the Lord Jesus Christ, only in one passage. So just turn back a page or two to Hebrews chapter 7. Here's the testimony of the Apostle concerning Jesus. Joseph was separate from his brethren. He was a Nazarite from his brethren. Here's the testimony concerning Jesus. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And this was a great problem to the scribes and Pharisees, because they just did not believe that Jesus was separate from sinners. This man receiveth sins and sinners and eateth with them. This man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of man, woman she is who touches him, because she is a sinner. And Simon the Pharisee didn't even want her in his house, let alone for her to touch him. But you see, Jesus was spiritually separated. He mixed with them. He went into their houses. He ate with them. But he never once condoned their behaviour. To the woman taken in adultery, he said, I don't condemn you. Don't do it again. Go and sin no more. To the man whom he healed on the Sabbath, he said, Go thy way. That's the worst thing, and that's the worst thing before the John John chapter five. I've forgotten the quote. Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. You see, Jesus was separate. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But he understood what the problem was. And he sought to help and encourage others up to his level. So we, brothers and sisters, also need to understand what spiritual separation is, as illustrated in the lives of Joseph and of Jesus, and seek to practice it in our lives, that we might help to do what they did. Joseph saved his brethren. Jesus has provided the means whereby many should come to salvation. Turn with me finally to Acts 7 again. A little clue in Acts 7. Acts 7 is another of those inspired commentaries on the Old Testament, in which Stephen, by the Spirit, tells us a number of things that we don't read in the Old Testament history. So, Acts 7, verse 14. Then sent Joseph, and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls, so Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem, 
and laid in the sepulchre that Abram bought for a sum of money of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now, Jacob wasn't buried in Shechem. Jacob was buried in Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah, as he commanded his sons in, in Genesis 50. So, the and were at the beginning of Acts 7, verse 16, doesn't refer to Jacob. It refers to the our fathers at the end of verse 15. We could read, Jacob died, he and our fathers, and they were carried over into Shechem, and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought of the sons of money, a sum of money of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And we know from the end of the book of Joshua, that's where Joseph was buried. The bones of Joseph, which they took out of Egypt and carried through the wilderness and brought into the land, were buried in Shechem in the portion of land that Jacob gave to Joseph. And Stephen's telling us that all of his 11 <coughs> brothers were buried in the same sepulchre. So on resurrection day, they'll all rise together, all 12 of them. And 11 of them will look at Joseph and say, you saved us, you brought us here. Because he sought his brethren. Wouldn't it be wonderful, brothers and sisters, we were standing at the judgment seat, and somebody came alongside us and said, you got me 